Um, I see. This is the uh, first in the series of uh, speaker series featuring uh, UH West Oahu scholars. And uh, this first one is entitled, I've Got the COVID Blues. Uh, I'm Dr. Rick, and today is April 28th. It's actually my mother's birthday. Uh, that's me, Dr. Rick. I was uh, very young when I started wearing white coats. And I have no financial interest in any group product or company discussed in this lecture. Uh, today's agenda, we're going to go through, uh, just, we just went through introductions, uh, quote of the day, uh, COVID and feelings, uh, the coronavirus overview, uh, history lesson for the day, uh, COVID-19 transmission, uh, a short course on medicine is all about tubes and tubing, uh, COVID-19 symptoms, clinical uh, clinical tools, and then bad news, and the COVID blues, and good news, and then questions. So uh, the quote for today is, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And certainly for all of us uh, today and everywhere in the world, uh, these are times of uh, challenge and controversy. Uh, today, uh, there are over 3 million cases, uh, 216,000 deaths. In the United States, uh, 1 million cases and 58,000 deaths. And in Hawaii, uh, we have 607 cases and 16 deaths, which uh, relative to the numbers you just heard uh, is, is not so bad. So, um, we talk about feelings, we talk about COVID. Uh, there are basically um, seven different kinds of coronavirus. Uh, this is distinct from influenza. And um, the first four that you see there, the uh, alpha, alpha, and beta, beta, those are real mild. And uh, the important thing about those, they're endemic, meaning that they're found all over the world. And uh, most of us have had a lot of them. Uh, those last two, MERS and SARS, um, they aren't endemic. Uh, they, they actually cause epidemics. And uh, here is a uh, kind of a comparison of uh, COVID-19 with MERS and SARS. So you can see this has only been over the last 18 years that uh, we've been discovering these new viruses, uh, Corona type. Uh, the uh, SARS was in 2002, MERS was in 2012, and then COVID was uh, just started last year. And you can see some of the comparisons there. Uh, it's really um, humbling. Uh, when you begin to see the numbers of deaths that were in MERS and SARS compared to what's happening now, yeah, and the number of countries. So <clears throat> right now we are in a pandemic. MERS and SARS were uh, an epidemic, and uh, 
the other four are endemic. The, some of the thinking is that uh, COVID-19 has to become or will become endemic in time. So it'll be in our system. It'll be coming, it'll be in the world uh, forever, basically. And uh, we will always be catching it. That's why becoming immune to it is very important. So the history lesson for today, uh, the 1918 Spanish flu, uh, 675,000 deaths in the United States and 50 million deaths uh, worldwide. Uh, day zero, uh, March 4th, uh, 1918, and the first infected person was in Kansas, USA. So it is a misnomer to actually call it the Spanish flu because uh, genetically they've traced it back to Kansas and especially to uh, an army barracks uh, in Kansas, and that's kind of how it spread out. So after only 40 days, uh, 20 million people uh, became infected and 20,000 uh, had died. Uh, here's some pictures from back then. So these are the heroes that uh, risked their lives. Uh, this looks a lot like what we were um, doing in New York in some of those uh, big stadiums. And now the, basically <clears throat> Philadelphia has a population of about 1.7 million uh, and an additional 300,000 people that had come into the city uh, to uh, ramp up for World War I. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, 75% of their surgical and medical staff were overseas uh, for the war. Their first case was uh, September 18th, uh, and it was reported in a shipyard. In St. Louis, they had this uh, guy named Max Starloff, who was the health commissioner then. Uh, St. Louis's first case was October 1st. And by October 5th in St. Louis, they had 500 cases. So within four or five days, uh, Max had closed off all the schools. Uh, the next day in uh, September 19th, when uh, the first reported case in the shipyard, 500 sailors uh, became ill. But unfortunately, what uh, Philadelphia did is uh, 10 days later, they had a parade to support the war effort that was attended by about 200,000 people. As that was happening, you know, after that, uh, you can see that in St. Louis, they closed everything. They closed factories, they closed stores. Uh, everything was closed, basically. And you can see the result. And this is um, why um, the uh, uh, stay at home is so important and why social distancing uh, is so important. Just, just the fact that uh, you can affect the, the curve and what they talk about flattening out the uh, peak. Uh, they, people made masks back then. So, uh, you know, 100 years later, there's no difference. Uh, and uh, they really did uh, uh, make people wear masks. I mean, uh, they, a policeman shot a guy for not wearing a mask. Uh, this is, this is uh, kind of sad. Uh, these are uh, graves of uh, three kids, basically. And then, this is even more sadder, um, they had a lot of babies that died that they didn't know who they were. Now, um, COVID transmission, uh, this one's really easy. COVID transmission is bad. Okay. Um, basically, uh, droplets, air droplets that uh, you can breathe, cough, or contact. Uh, and uh, catch COVID. Uh, the transmission cycle, um, you can kind of see starting at the top, uh, we're talking about bats having coronavirus, going to some kind of intermediary, all right? And uh, they're thinking it might be a pangolin, not so sure. Uh, but after that, it goes into the human through direct contact. So um, that's why the um, wet uh, markets in Wuhan uh, were so critical. Um, I actually saw my first uh, patient from Wuhan on uh, January 20th, and we had to clear him because he had been in that area. Uh, and uh, fortunately, he, had, he and his family didn't go to those wet markets. Um, so once somebody has it, the air droplet contact, you can see at the uh, five o'clock position, uh, incidental host, and then uh, going to the hospital. Uh, this is a concept that um, is good to know. It's called r naught, and it's an R with a zero. And it's the basic reproduction ratio, which, is, uh, which tells you how many new people an average patient spreads the disease to. Now the r naught is important because we can predict how far and how fast the disease can spread. Uh, if we, we look at influenza, the r naught is 1.0, both strains, A and B, 
And um, what that means is if I have it, I, can only, I usually only give it to one other person. Uh, for SARS, the r naught was 2.5 to 3.0. So they, um, one person could give it up to three people. And COVID's kind of right there too, uh, 2.0 to 2.5. Um, and uh, I put measles in there. Uh, it's 12 to 16, uh, basically because uh, we still are having problems with measles. And this is why it's so effective. Uh, the droplets, COVID droplets can go, that, 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 that's the six feet thing. Well, measles is 100 feet. And um, it can last for over uh, three hours. So one person can ultimately infect 16. And that's why it spreads so quickly. And that's why it's important to get shots. Uh, this is what an R naught of two looks like. So you can kind of see how quickly uh, one person giving it to another, those guys giving it to another, uh, uh, that it can spread. And um, the R naught is really important in, uh, if you've heard about those uh, um, meat packing uh, places where they're standing right next to each other, uh, they actually got infected uh, really quickly. Uh, the incubation is two to 14 days. Uh, there are some outliers up to 27. But um, basically, the average is somewhere around five, five to seven. Uh, and um, I use that too in my head because uh, um, just when I'm seeing patients uh, to figure out if I'm going to be getting it or not. Now, this is kind of cool. Medicine is really easy, right? Medicine is really, it's hard to get in and it's hard to get out. But um, the concept of uh, practicing clinical medicine is very easy because it's all about tubes and tubing. Right, so here we go. Cardiac system tubes are heart, blood vessels, arteries, and veins, as you can see on there. The digestive system tubes are esophagus, stomach, and intestines. These are all tubes. Respiratory system tubes are nose, ears, trachea, and lungs. Right. Now, this is important because all these tubes are lined with mucous membrane cells. Right? And what the mucous membrane cells do is uh, they try to protect the body from being infected uh, by viruses and bacteria. And they also keep the, the tissues of the body uh, adequately uh, moisturized. So you can see that there's mucosa uh, in the lungs and there's also mucosa uh, in the uh, digestive system. Now many uh, mucosal membranes or have uh, the cells have what are called ACE2 receptors, right? And uh, there's a whole list of them there, but the ones that are really important, you can see are lung, small intestine, heart, kidney, and brain, especially for COVID. Right? Because COVID likes to bind or really does bind to the ACE2 receptor. And that's how it gets into the cell. You can see uh, an electron micrograph there of, uh, of uh, COVID binding. So once it binds, it gets into the cell, uh, kind of basically, uh, steals the cells are replicating uh, powers and creates more COVID. And that, that's, that's the entire thing. That's how uh, uh, it, uh, that's basically the infection when, uh, when that starts. So the symptoms, the basic ones we've heard of, uh, everybody knows fever, cough, and shortness of breath. But when you start thinking about other symptoms, then that's when the mucosa stuff kind of makes sense, right? So for COVID, um, overall, if you start at the top, uh, there's fever, and that's a response, immune response to a uh, virus or uh, an invader. And uh, your body basically makes fever because the virus is very uh, sensitive to temperatures. Right? Now, if you start looking at respiratory, uh, nose and trachea, there's not much running nose, and um, that's possibly because it goes straight into the lungs. And it's uh, going into the lungs, it's uh, binding with those um, receptors, and then it's replicating in there. And uh, what, the, what the body does, it uh, begins to make more mucus uh, and inflammatory cells to try to fight it. And that's where that dry cough or the thick sputum cough uh, from the lungs come from. Right? Now, um, the, the digestive system if it gets into your throat, that, that may be why a lot of people are reporting sore throat. So you can see one out of seven are report sore throat. Uh, and uh, nausea and vomiting is about one out of 20. And diarrhea is about one out of 20. So this is an infection of the digestive system, not necessarily the respiratory system. Right? There's also a neurological component where um, in the mouth, you can have a loss of sense of taste or a loss of sense of smell. 
And uh, the thinking is that uh, can be, when, when it goes through the nose, it goes actually up the olfactory nerve. And then the conjunctiva, there's a, a concept called red eyes. Uh, uh, you get uh, kind of COVID red eyes. Uh, and that, uh, isn't, that doesn't have a, a very good outcome. So for, to, to prevent a lot of entry, you just got to think about how you close those ports. So for respiratory and uh, nasal um, and, and oral, uh, you wear a mask. And then um, for the conjunctiva, um, you wear eye protection. Now, right? So again, you can kind of see the tubes. So um, one of the scarier parts that's coming up now uh, that um, in recent is we're finding that there, there is a uh, myocarditis or a, an inflammation of the heart. And um, the, the newest stuff coming out is that it is very similar to Kawasaki syndrome. Uh, Kawasaki syndrome is uh, an immune um, response uh, and we never knew what it was. And uh, Hawaii actually had um, the most uh, cases of Kawasaki syndrome uh, uh, in the country at one time. And uh, we, we do have one of the best experts here. Her name is uh, Dr. Marion Mellish. Um, but it is a, an inflammation of the heart, the blood vessels, the arteries. Uh, and uh, these kids, you can tell they have red lips, they have uh, uh, red eyes. And that's all that um, inflammation that's happening when the, when the binding comes. Uh, the digestive system, uh, esophagus, stomach, and intestines, um, same thing. Uh, when you have uh, swelling and inflammation uh, and attacking the uh, digestive system, you're going to have digestive system uh, symptoms, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, and nausea. And uh, the respiratory system, uh, we know about trachea and lungs. So overall, uh, fever is the biggest one. All right, dry cough is the second, uh, fatigue is third, and then you can kind of see the shortness of breath uh, is next, and then uh, a lot of other things uh, can happen at the same time. So you don't necessarily have to have a um, fever, cough to um, be diagnosed with COVID. You might have a, a, um, a digestive system uh, type of COVID. Uh, one of the other um, uh, kind of things that they're finding out recently is that uh, a lot of the patients that uh, got admitted uh, to the hospital, about 70% of them didn't have fever. And, and that's kind of a scary thing uh, on, on, uh, on um, first uh, check. Okay. So the basic two tools, uh, one is your thermometer, right? Uh, make sure you have one at home. Uh, and uh, anything over 100, you kind of have to worry about a little bit. And the second, uh, I think that you should be, um, you should get yourself a pulse oximeter. Right. And a pulse oximeter is, um, oops, there you go. Pulse oximeter is very easy to use. You put your, your finger on it, you press this little button, and I think you can kind of see that. Where is it? Is it re registering? Yeah, so my saturation is 98, and my pulse is uh, 89. All right. Now, a word to the wise about fever. Uh, when I was a fourth year medical student, I uh, went to Palau uh, in Micronesia uh, and I worked there for a, a few months and uh, um, I was a fresh, fresh medical student, had this uh, man come in with uh, um, complaints of a sore throat, right? So um, we didn't have uh, medical assistance, so we had to do all, our, all this stuff on our own. And so I, I started taking his temperature, you know, with, uh, with the uh, uh, thermometer and um, I saw that there were different colors. So I thought red would be for, um, you know, somebody that was hot. I don't, I don't know why I was thinking that. So I, I, I put the thermometer in his mouth and uh, I, I looked at the nurse and I said, oh, is it the red or the blue thermometer? And uh, unfortunately, I had put a rectal thermometer uh, into my patient's mouth. <laughs> and uh, when I asked him how he felt, uh, he said, well, his, his throat uh, just got a lot more sore. So um, that's... That's uh, in medicine, you learn uh, kind of by doing so. All right. Now, uh, shortness of breath, um, why and how? So these alveolar cells or the epithelial, the mucosal cells that are in the lungs, um, this type of cell, there are different types. And this one, the type two cell have the ACE2 receptors. So those are the ones that make mucus, they make surfactant, they regulate the immune response and they manage the degree of inflammation. 
And unfortunately, these are the cells that COVID-19 attacks. So um, what we're finding is that uh, there may be a real problem with surfactant. Now, uh, surfactant helps you to expand your lungs. If you, if you think about uh, trying to blow up a balloon, and that first, when you first blow, put in air, it, it, it resists it. Well, the surfactant makes it more pliable so it can come out. And that's exactly what it does in the lungs. And um, we found this out through uh, neonates. And uh, before, uh, probably about 30, yeah, I guess about 30 years ago, um, it was really hard for certain babies to survive, especially if they were um, two months early, uh, two or three months early. And that's because their lungs didn't make surfactant. Um, and you can see in that, that uh, bottom one, uh, the normal alveoli is like that. And surfactant, it's a collapsed lung. It, it just can't aerate. Uh, when you put in the surfactant, and, and I've seen this happen, we were, uh, Kapiolani uh, Children's Hospital was part of the trials. Uh, you could see the lung uh, expand, and it was, it, was, it was amazing to see. Uh, so now we're saving kids that are 26 weekers versus um, 32, 33 weekers, and that, that's pretty amazing. Uh, so surfactant is used routinely. And I have, a, I have a feeling you'll begin to start hearing about um, surfactant trials being used in uh, COVID patients because uh, their, their lungs aren't making enough surfactant and that makes it really hard to breathe. And when you hear those um, patients talk about their symptoms and how they've been doing, they really um, talk about their just air hunger and it's just so hard to breathe. Um, now clinically, if we look at the uh, CT scans, of uh, COVID-19 patients with pneumonia. Uh, an interesting thing is that the um, virus attacks the outer portions of the lungs. So you can kind of see um, on the upper left, uh, those, those lighter areas is where the COVID is. And then on the bottom, you're, you're looking right at it. You're looking right at it. So um, with our, the stuff that we have now medically, to diagnose, uh, we can do di good diagnosis, but unfortunately we don't have uh, such strong treatments. Uh, clinical tools that are used, the pulse oximeter, right? So the bad news is that there's no immunity, uh, no pills and no shot. Right? Uh, the mortality is kind of in between. So uh, mortality um, right now is about 3.4. So one out of 30 uh, uh, pass away. Uh, influenza A was one out of 1,000. And uh, you can look down there at Ebola, and uh, Ebola was nine out of 10. Uh, that's why it's such a bad disease. Uh, and then the second thing is we need to expect three waves. Uh, you're looking at two graphs. The upper graph is the uh, Spanish flu, the 1918 and the lower one is the 2009 uh, uh, influenza pandemic. So you can kind of see the three waves and they, the, uh, the waves kind of correspond to when the regular flu seasons are. So uh, we may get very lucky uh, and uh, uh, things will really slow down around June or July. Uh, we'll have a little bit of uh, break, but probably by uh, November, uh, December, uh, we'll start seeing a lot of cases again then it'll slow down uh, and we'll, we'll have another break. So um, it's important to expect that. So uh, blues, you get the blues a lot of times when you have no control uh, over uh, what you can do. Uh, so.
walking in the clinic. Gotta wear a mask. Oh, just to get a new one. Get on your knee and ask. With cases spreading and surging, PPE's gotta last. Oh, Macy's, Ross, and Nordstrom. All are closed. Starting to have withdrawals. No new clothes. With eating and better shopping, I can't see my toes. Well, tomorrow's got me scared, cause the bills are gonna be due. Forced to do telemedicine, I don't even have a clue. I got the COVID, I got the COVID blues. Well, COVID's got me worried, and now I'm feeling all you. Okay, so the good news, all right, is that there will be another noisy time between classes. That will happen. There will be another building, all right? And you can kind of see up upper left. Uh, these pictures were all taken this morning. So uh, you can see the, the uh, progress of the uh, student area and the progress of creative media. There will be another time to meet and talk story. There will be another class to teach. There will be another time in the Halle or on the mountain. There will be another graduation. There will be another boys day. And lastly, there will be another mother's day. Are there any questions? All right, thank you very much. Lynette asked a question um, in the group chat, which wave are we in now? We are in the first wave. Yep, so we have two more to go. Um, I, mentally, what I'm preparing for is uh, fall, or probably, I'm, I'm thinking July 1st of uh, 2021 in terms of feeling that uh, we probably will have it semi under control. <laughs> and a lot of things have to happen though. I mean, we, we, we need a lot more testing. We need a lot, we need a vaccine. Uh, we need a lot more treatments. Uh, the, the scary part of this is that it changes very quickly and it's a really sneaky virus. Uh, the New England Journal just came out with a, uh, um, a, an article about uh, people uh, 25 to 35, 40 years old uh, having uh, dropping dead uh, from uh, cardiac complications. Uh, and uh, the, a lot of the things that we've thought were um, foundational uh, aren't. You know, the, the young aren't as protected as we thought they were. Uh, and uh, the virus is a little bit more uh, transmissible than we thought it was before. And the question? All right. Well, please tune in for the uh, next ones coming up tomorrow. And uh, um, I will see you guys around. So aloha, salamat, and mabuhay.